Welcome again to the wonderful world of genealogy, a Newcastle Family History Society podcast. The Newcastle Family History Society, located on a Wabakal land in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia, provides support for those interested in family history. Have you ever wondered why you have the given or surname you do? The origin of names and the traditions and naming patterns adopted by our ancestors can be really useful considerations when tracing your family history. In this episode, Marie and Ken Schilling will shed light on what's in a name. William, go to bed. No, this was not a directive from a frazzled mother trying to cope with her obstreperous child at the end of a long and tiring day. Go to bed was in fact a surname found in the north of England, and according to Basil Cottle, in his Dictionary of Surnames, it was derived from an old English word meaning laziness. If you're lucky, your family name might also indicate a region of origin. Names can be frustrating, but at the same time, intriguing. Today, we place emphasis on a surname, but this was not always the case. Surnames were originally introduced to help tell people apart who shared the same forename. For example, in a very early English village, there could have been John the Cooper and James on the Hill. But as the population started to grow, another John and another James became part of the village population, and so John the Cooper became known as John Cooper, while James on the Hill's name was shortened to James Hill. When John Cooper had a son, also named John, the little boy was called John, the son of John, or later in time, John Johnson. The evolution of names can be intriguing. It was not until the 12th century that some surnames became hereditary and were passed from a father to his children. But names came into being from a number of different sources, occupations being an obvious one. You might have to look back through many generations to find if your Cooper name originated from a barrel-making ancestor or your Smith name came from someone who forged iron or worked with silver and gold. Names such as Fletcher and Fuller refer to older occupations, a Fletcher being a man who made arrows and a Fuller being a cloth bleacher. Topographical names describe a geographical feature where people lived and included names such as Marsh, Underhill or Forest. Yet another source for a name involved nicknames giving us Armstrong, Little and Black as examples. Some cultures have a naming pattern which may or may not be followed in your family. For example, the use of MAC or MC in Scottish names or the O apostrophe in Irish names is well known and is used to indicate descent from a family ancestor. Thus, we have MacDonald descended from Donald, or O'Neill from Neil. In Wales, once the use of a name passed down from a father had become too common, people added the grandfather's name. So we find David, up Gwilym, up Owen, being David, son of Gwilym, and grandson of Owen. The Chinese attempted to differentiate between people by adding a generational name, which allowed everyone to know how many generations they were descended from their family's founder. Written versions of women's names often included she or she after the family name to indicate that a woman was married. Thus we have Ham C as an example, which tells us that this name is for a married woman born into the Ham family. Most Indian people have several names, a personal name, a name derived from a father or ancestor, a village name, and if Hindu, a caste name. It may not be obvious to Western eyes 
which is the equivalent of a personal name and which is the surname. In southern India, many people have three surnames, the village name, the father's name and the personal name. Westernisation has sometimes caused such patterns to alter and many Indian families coming to the West will fix their ancestral name as an hereditary surname, just like the Welsh coming to England in the Middle Ages. If your family originated in a country other than those already mentioned, it would be worthwhile to put naming pattern and the country of origin into your computer's search engine. The result might be very helpful in sorting out your ancestors. One trap which family historians should be wary about is assuming that because they carry a certain surname, they must link back to the aristocracy. In early times, people working on a lord's estate would sometimes take his family name as their own, either to validate their position in the village or as a form of protection. However, taking your master's name is one thing, but you would certainly not be entitled to assume his coat of arms. That is for him and his immediate family only. Even today, we have people expressing their right to a coat of arms simply because they share a particular name. Although names such as Alfred and Edric were used in very early times, the use of Christian names or given names as we know them appeared sometime later than surnames with names from the Bible such as Nathaniel, Benjamin and Abraham being commonly used in the Western world. It seems quite strange to think that today so many people from Western Europe are walking around using names derived from a tiny tribe that lived in the Middle East over 2,000 years ago. Mary and James still rate on the most popular list of names used today. It was not until the 18th century that the use of a second forename appeared. This could be in recognition of a very good family friend or the family's belief that bestowing a saint's name would bring a long and fruitful life to a newborn. The desire to associate a newborn with the fame of a figure from history can sometimes cause embarrassment for a child later in life. One such child who has spared the need to explain his name lies quietly in Oakhampton Cemetery, his headstone being the only object to remind us of his name, Oliver Cromwell Cooper. Sometimes the mother's maiden name was used as a second forename or could be joined to the family's surname to make a double barrel name. Taking a fictional example, when George Witherspoon and his wife, Margaret Simpson, welcomed their first baby, the little boy was baptised with the names John George, after his grandfather John and his father George. For his surname, his mother's name of Simpson was joined with a hyphen to the family's name of Witherspoon. Thus we have John George Simpson Witherspoon, quite a mouthful for such a small person. If you come across a hyphenated name in your family, you might have to separate the surname when carrying out further research. Using our example again, you might not be able to find any information about a John George Simpson Witherspoon, but records could reveal facts about a John George Simpson or a John George Witherspoon which fit well on your family tree. I have mentioned before that names can be frustrating for family historians and none more so than when it comes to spelling. We should not expect that our names today have always had the same spelling. Comments are often heard such as, No, that can't be my Ferguson's. It has two S's. Our name only has one S in it. Researchers should always be prepared to consider alternative spellings and be ready to substitute or omit letters. Think for a moment about those keeping early records. 
Perhaps they were not skilled in handwriting and spelling, or maybe they had encountered a dialect which was quite different to their own. Imagine an English surgeon on a convict transport ship attempting to record the information of a Gaelic-speaking Irish prisoner. Health problems, such as a simple cold, could alter the way a name was heard and therefore written into the records. If your ancestor came from an area where people dropped their H's, you might find names such as Hester, recorded as Esther, or Helen, recorded as Ellen. It's an interesting exercise to draw up a list of possible spellings for your family name as your research progresses. You may be surprised at the number of variations. Sometimes an ancestor seems to suddenly disappear from all records and the possibility of a complete change of name could be one explanation. In early times, family relationships could account for some name changes, particularly in the upper levels of society, when the name change of an ancestor was a necessity in order to fulfil the requirements of a will which may have contained future ownership of a large estate. Today, it is comparatively simple to change your name, and while some have done this officially, it is suspected that the majority of name changes have just been through usage, with no legal recording. There are many reasons why someone might want to change their name. For example, an adopted child might wish to revert to their birth name, or an illegitimate child registered under their mother's name could wish to adopt the father's name if it was known. A number of name changes occurred around the early days of World War I, when underaged men attempted to enlist for service overseas without parental permission. Persecution due to a name was common in times of war, and perhaps one of the most recognisable examples of this was when King George V changed the royal family's name from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor in 1917. Other name changes have occurred simply to make the use easier. How many times do you still have to spell your name for people even today? It is possible someone wanted to escape an abusive household or wanted to distance themselves from the criminal activities of their forebears or, on a more mundane level, simply didn't like their given name. Reasons for changing names are endless. Another problem for some family historians could occur if your ancestor has a given name and a surname which could be reversed. For example, Thomas James may have been mistakenly transcribed in an index as James Thomas. This would put the name in a different position in the index where you might not think to look. The same index may contain a name, but due to poor writing on an original document, a transcriber has assumed the spelling for example, Marion Jones is in the index, although she was baptised as Mary Ann. Indexes can be most helpful, but a researcher needs to be aware of the pitfalls that can catch people unawares. One interesting point to remember, if you're carrying out some Scottish research, is that on legal documents, memorials and other sources, a woman may be recorded using her maiden name, although she had been married for quite some time. The first burial in Newcastle Sandgate Cemetery was that of Scottish-born Mary Wilson. She had married John Miller in Scotland in 1833 and together with their three surviving children sailed for Australia in 1849. The family settled in Newcastle and became involved in the local Presbyterian Church. However, in 1881, Mary died and was buried in what was described as a wild and unkempt area named Newcastle General Cemetery. By the time of John's death in the following year, the cemetery had some semblance of order 
and he was laid to rest beside his wife. At the top of the headstone on Mary's grave is the inscription, Sacred to the Memory of Mary Wilson, the beloved wife of John Miller. So, although Mary was known socially as Mrs. Miller, she was buried under her maiden name of Wilson, but her marriage was acknowledged on her headstone. Does someone on your family tree have a name which seems to make no sense to you? If it is possible that they were born at sea, they may have been given the name of the ship as their middle name, or perhaps the use of the captain's name, provides your ancestors' given and middle names. In the 1839 voyage of the Basora Merchant, John Shipway and his wife Eliza became the proud parents of a baby boy on the 25th of August. Upon arrival in Sydney, the baby's birth was registered and he carried the name Andrew Bussera Charles Shipway for life. Today, inspiration for names still comes from a variety of sources. Families who have recently come to this country might choose to keep the ties to their country of birth through the use of names given to their newborn children. But the idea of a naming pattern in families with names being handed down through the generations, is weakening. Names used at the beginning of the 20th century, such as Ruby, Pearl, Rose and Daisy, are not on today's list of the most popular names for girls. Although the influence of movie stars has waned as a source for given names, such as those of Ava Gardner, Clark Gable and Audrey Hepburn, A short time ago, there were many young girls given the name of Kylie, no doubt revealing their parents' admiration for the popular singer Kylie Minogue. The main characters in books no longer seem to be an inspiration for names, with today's television programs seemingly filling that role. Parents today seem to favour a variety of names which might come from a friend's family, such as Tanika or Michaela or they simply use their imagination and come up with something quite unique. Names can help or hinder a search, but are essential to building your family's absorbing story. Family historians will find many names in their ancestry that do not appear in the standard reference books. Some may be indications of immigrant ancestry, Others perhaps preserve some long-forgotten incident. The answer may lie in a document somewhere waiting to be discovered, or it may remain a puzzle forever. Yet another interesting and informative podcast. Thank you, Marie and Ken. In the next episode, our seasoned researchers will delve into the possibilities of how, when and why your ancestors arrived on our shores along with the essential paper trail to follow. Don't miss out. Join us again on Newcastle Family History Society Podcasts.